In 2003, I was trekking in the Colombian jungle, um, and on September the 12th, uh, 4.30 in the morning, a group of armed men burst into the hut that me and several others were staying in and took us hostage. Um, they turned out to be a group called the ELN, which is the National Liberation Army. It's a Marxist guerrilla group that's been around in Colombia for 40, 50 years. There was me, a German girl, a Spanish guy, and four Israelis. Um, Two of them were released early, and then the five of us, five remaining, were released on the 22nd of December 2003, um, after we'd been there for 101 days. I had guns pointed at my head, you know, being told that they were going to shoot me. Um, and it's those things that st stick with you. I think the worst thing is just not knowing. You, you just know nothing. Um, you don't know if you're ever going to see your family again. You don't know if you're ever going to go home again. Um, you don't know if you're ever going to have go back to that life you had before, um, and that's that's the thing that's really hard to deal with. About six months after I was released, I met up um, for dinner with the priest who had negotiated our release. He's a Colombian priest, and he was over in London. And he said, uh, "There's someone from the mountains that wants to get in touch with you." And I kind of, first of all, thought, "Well, who, who can that be?" Because I'm in touch with all the other hostages. You know, we're we're all friends and and whatnot. And he said, "Oh, it's it's one of one of the." captors I think he said um, and I knew almost straight away which one it would be that it would be this guard Antonio because he was the one that I struck up a relationship with had got on with better than the others he's the one that kind of shown some sparks of humanity whereas the others sometimes have been quite cruel to us um, and I handed over my email address thinking I'm not sure where this is going to go um, but I'm quite excited about this I'm quite intrigued I didn't hear anything for about four months or five months and then suddenly in November, mid-November, I got an email in my inbox. Once he got in touch with me, I knew that there was this person out there, I knew that there was, that Antonio was out there somewhere and that he could give me the answers and also um, I, I knew that if I didn't go back and meet him then I'd probably regret it or it would be hanging over me um, and I didn't know which was, you know, I think that, was, that would have been worse. Four, I mean, four of us went back, two of the Israelis and um, a German girl called Riley. I mean, they all jumped at the opportunity. As soon as I said, do you want to go back? Um, they said yes, and I think everyone had very different reasons for doing it, but everyone wanted to do it. And I think it was so useful doing it together. Um, I think if we'd gone back as individuals, it would have been a very different experience. We met with Antonio and, and also his wife. Um, she was then his girlfriend and she was also involved in the kidnapping, but not as much as he was. She, she wasn't involved at the level he was. So we agreed to meet later that evening and do an interview. And we thought this interview would take last a couple of hours and actually it lasted seven hours. Um, and it went on to about four o'clock in the morning. And we kept on saying to him, uh, you, you can go home if you want and we'll do this tomorrow, we'll finish this tomorrow. And he, you know, he, and he insisted, he said, no, no, I want to do this, I want to do this now. Um, and the action of Antonio um, staying in that interview, not leaving, uh, wanting us to ask him everything, you know, wanting us to question him any way we could, him saying, I will answer any of your questions, that was an action, that was him saying, you know what, um, the roles have reversed now. And it was like he was giving us something back. He knew he'd taken something incredibly precious from us, our freedom, and he was giving us something back. So even just that act of allowing us to interview was really symbolic. It was interesting, he, he did apologise, he apologised for what he did to us and it wasn't prompted, we didn't say is there something you'd like to tell us, is there something, you know, it came halfway through an answer and he just turned around and he said look I want to say something, I want to say I'm sorry about what happened to you um, and even though he slightly stumbles over the words you know that he means it. I think actually forgiveness is of such a, uh, it's not black and white, it's a very difficult concept to, to, uh, to explain. I needed to know what he felt as a human being. I didn't want him to be just a soldier in this army, I wanted, to, I wanted to know what it felt like as a human being to take someone hostage and to look at us every day and, and see that we were suffering. And I think in the end I, he, you know, he accepted that that, he, he, that, that was wrong and, and, and that, that, that affected him. But one thing I did learn while I was kidnapped was that 
I found anger to be a very useless emotion, um, especially in, in that situation. There was no use being angry with them because there was nothing it could do. Anger just wound me up. It just made me, uh, you know, it made the situation for me internally worse. I couldn't punch them, I couldn't shout at them, I couldn't scream at them, I couldn't do anything. Um, and even though there were times when I was so angry, I was just, you know, uncontrollably angry, I had to keep a dampener on that, I had to, you know, not let that emotion override everything else because you wouldn't be able to survive on a day-to-day -day basis. And I think that's one of the things I've taken from the whole situation, that what's the use of being angry with these people? It's not going to prove anything, it's not going to gain me anything to be angry with them.